well, actually, we were somehow had propelled ourselves into the Second World War and the Japanese advancing from Burma. Um, Slim, in his uh, Defeat into Victory, has a very moving paragraph where he says that uh, the heroism and uh, courage of the Nagas was absolutely outstanding and that many a British soldier owes his life to their, their uh, actions and that through the torture and burning of their villages yes. they remained absolutely constant. I wondered if you'd encountered any particular examples of Naga? Yes, I, I heard of some. There was one particular instance. There was a Naga who was acting as scout and guide to a patrol, and I may say a patrolling in gen dense jungle, when you couldn't see three feet on either side. It frightened the life out of me. As I hear it frightened the life out of the Marines in Borneo, I don't, uh, and Malaya, I don't think I was so very much at fault. But we, the, the patrols, they had a native scout out in front. And then there was a gap of about 50 yards. Then the first half of the patrol with an officer in charge. And then behind came the rear half. And when we patrolled, I was usually in charge of the rear half. But there was 50 yards in between. So that if the front half bumped something, the scout would meet it first. And these trails wound and it would, if possible, give the alarm to the front half of the patrol, which would take up ambush positions. This would alarm the rear half of the patrol, which would also dive the jungle and take up ambush positions. But there were good gaps between to give us plenty of room for warning. And this particular man, who was leading his patrol by 50 yards, turned a corner and went face to face with an advancing Jap patrol. If he doubled back, they were too close to him, the, um, they would double after him and go straight into an unwarned uh, patrol that he was leading. So he raised his muzzle loader and simply shot the nearest Jap. Well, they thought he was just a passing Naga. And they opened up on him with automatic fire and, of course, riddled him, as he knew would happen. But the automatic fire alerted his patrol, who dived into ambush. The Japs walked on round the bend and they got them. But if ever a man gave his life for his friends, he did. Uh, then there was another case. I believe he was a summer, a very warlike lot. The um, uh, rest of the villagers wanted to bolt and make no attempt to hold up the Jap advance. And he said this wouldn't do, it was dishonourable. He was a subject of the king, and he was going to do his bit. All alone, he armed himself, he had no far off, he armed himself with spear and iron shield, went out, and went single-handed for a Jap patrol, and killed five of them before they shot him. He didn't mind, that was what he was going to do, his bit for the honour of uh, the king, and that was it. He did. When, when your husband, uh, or your uh, husband-to-be, was retreating um, from uh, Burma, from the Chindwin, mm. I, I gather he was frequently saved and uh, helped on his way by the Nagas. He would never have got out without them. He was overrun right on the chin, within 200 miles from Kohima, over most frightfully steep country. His camp was overrun, all the rations and everything were taken or destroyed, and he and a small party of Gurkhas uh, had to get, try to get back to Kohima, and it happened. They had a, just about a Japanese division in front of them to get back. They had to go right through it. And he walked out those 200 miles, starving, and at one point he was almost on the point of giving up. He just kept going by uh, taking a landmark a few hundred yards away and say, I'll go there, and then I'll give up, and then another one, and then I'll give up. And he kept on this way. And then he saw a wooded ravine down below him. And that was a cool, quiet, sheltered place. That was a place to go and finish it, just lie down and die. He staggered into the ravine, barefoot in rags and starving, 
and went straight into a party of Nagas who'd been driven out of their village by the Japs. And one old lady, seeing him in this state, burst into floods of tears and handed him the only food she had with her, which was a small bit of pork, about that long and an inch square. And he sat down and ate that then and there. And on it he carried on for another two days. Uh, another Naga village, he got through the Japan. He'd been right through by then, and missed them. Um, sheltered him in the village and fed him, so put out scouts, warned him when the Japs were coming and got him on his way. And yet another, within a few miles of Kohima, handed over his rations, which got my husband the last 12 miles in. He was missing three weeks. His normal weight was 11 stone 7. He came out barefoot in absolute rags at six stone. And it was only because of the Nagas he survived at all. He's never forgotten it. You yourself somehow became perhaps the only European lady leading a, a group of um, fighting troops against the Japanese. How, how did that occur? Well, it was again that I got off the combatant service. It was one of those little accidents. Uh, as I knew the Zemi very well, they were difficult because of the Guy de Liu business. But I had come to know them and they trusted me. And uh, a, u a unit had been formed in the 14th Army for scouting and intelligence using tribal scouts. And uh, this was very much a rear area. We were 150 miles behind the front. But we backed onto a railway there were trails going across to Imphal, and it was perfectly easy for agents to slip up from the railway across the hills and uh, gather intelligence or bring in uh, messages from the uh, Japanese side. So we were put there with tribal watch posts to check anybody using the hills without passes. And um, they were not supposed to fight, they were simply there to stop unauthorised passers. And the idea was that if things got nasty and things got dangerous, a British officer would be sent to take over from me. But meantime, because they trusted me, I was to recruit them and try and run them in. And uh, this went on quite successfully until the Japs came in, in March 1944. And I was sitting perfectly peacefully in my camp when my head interpreter arrived and said that two British sergeants had arrived. There they were, two rather hot and breathless uh, field security sergeants, who said without preamble, please, miss, have you seen any Japs? Well, as far as I knew, the nearest Japs were on the Chindwin, so this was a little startling. They then went on to explain about the extent of the advance. We did, I, we did know that they were advancing, but I had no idea that there was anything so close. And a party of 50 Japs had apparently left the top end of the Imphal Plain and were marching rapidly in my direction. And as we were on the main track from Manipur out to the railway and there was a very vulnerable bridge just behind it, behind us. And if that were blown, a vital railway would have been put out of commission for the whole of the war. Things were looking a little nasty. And um, various troops came up. We went out looking for these Japs, hunting for them. They weren't there. As I say, they turned aside and gone south and intercepted uh, an officer coming out to join me and killed him. And uh, then, after a great deal of toing and froing and a, a lot of fuss and anxiety and patrolling, uh, we got on a more regular basis. But V Force, this actually it was a top secret organisation, so secret we hardly knew who we were, um, somebody was sent out to back me up because the British officers 
it was mostly operating, like my husband, who was also in it, on the chinwin and along the front. They'd all been overrun, and half of them were trying to walk out. There was no one to come and take my place. However, HQ, down at 14th Army, sent me a signal telling me to get out and get out quick. Well, this took a little time to arrive. Meantime, a company of uh, troops had arrived and uh, were looking for the Japs. And um, I set out to guide them with some of my scouts. And I sent a cable saying, going forward to look for the enemy, kindly send rifles and ammunition soonest. Uh, weapons and ammunition, I think I said, and rifles. And this crossed with the war, telling me to get out. And when it arrived at V-Force HQ, Colonel Scott, the, my OC, clapped his bush hat on his head, looked at my signal, which was uh, quite unintentionally pure Nelson, and rushed round to see Slim, slapped the telegram on the desk, and said, from Miss Bower, sir. And Slim looked at it and uh, said, we must support her. And I got back from that patrol to find boxes of rifles lying on the floor of my hut and boxes of grenades, large boxes of ammunition, and 150 pounds of gunpowder for my men's muzzle loaders. Well, I never thought that a box of grenades could look beautiful, but it did. It was one of the nicest sights I've ever seen. Because we were up to that point armed with one shotgun and the muzzle loader. And uh, shortly afterwards, a star, well, this was a staff officer arrived with the rifles, and he and I held the fort for a while until Kohima was relieved. Kohima was up the range from us, but not so very far. Uh, a few days, what was what were we about? Uh, oh, good going, I should think, six days March. Which is nothing really. And then, when Kohima was relieved, there arrived very cheerfully, hanging on to the back of a baggage mule for a tow, hanging on to the tail, a subaltern, Bill Tibbets, who had been right through the siege of Kohima, had a very short rest and rekit, and had arrived with a half section of Assam rifles, also fresh from the first siege of Kohima. Well, the first thing they did, before they even took their boots off, was to dig a bomb-proof bunker on the top of the hill by the camp. After their experiences at Kohima, home wasn't home without a bomb-proof bunker. As soon as they'd built the bunker, they were quite happy. They, they, we had a hut for them, and they took off their boots and went to bed. Stayed there for three days. And we went on from there as a much more regular force. We had a supporting company of Marathas down by the railway. And it was our job to gather intelligence, and if we could, find targets through our intelligence for a Maratha patrols to go out and uh, tackle. Well, after the siege of Kohima was totally raised, which the whole, the, the double siege lasted about six weeks before the Japs were on the run. And it was thought, as the forces from Imphal moved up and 2nd Division moved down, that some of the Japs caught in the squeeze might break out our way. So we moved eastwards Bill Tibbets and the Nagas, or some Nagas, and our workers and I, and occupied Tamming Long, where I had been so many years before, and um, based ourselves there and were searching through our intelligence for targets uh, and possible Japs between us and the M4 plane, which was about three days' march. But the Japs were by that time. Uh, more or less in retreat, and after a short while, uh, 
shot he was mailed very nearly over with the Japs were moving back eastward towards Chinwin. Mm -hmm. And we held, kept on until, kept the things going, kept the unit going until November that year. And then everything had gone forward into Burma and we were disbanded. So that was the mm -hmm. end of that. Marvellous. You mentioned that Slim, Field Marshal Slim, sent you some ammunition when you needed it. Did you ever get to, to meet the great um, victor of the Burmese War? I did indeed. Uh, much to my alarm, I happened to be down at V Force HQ. They were very good. They used to ask, get me down on pretext of uh, collecting supplies at Comilla, which was only an excuse to let me get to Calcutta and um, get a perm wave and some new clothes. And uh, my CO, Colonel Scott, suddenly came rushing up to me. Uh, my nickname with the Army was GB, shouting to me, GB, GB, get dressed, get, get your best clothes on. I sent four to HQ. Slim wants you. I thought, oh, heavens my God, here we go. Typing pool in Delhi, I'm going to be chucked out. This is the finish. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Help. I hastily changed it to the best dress I could find anywhere. It was hastily inspected by my CO to see that my stocking seams were straight and my petticoat wasn't showing. Bundled into a jeep, driven round to HQ, getting more and more scared, um, and then was taken over by a very smart brigadier. And the HQ building was an enormous long block with a veranda that looked like a bomber runway. It seemed to go on forever. We walked up this, and all along the right-hand side there were offices, and the further forward one went more senior, the, um, the officers in them, and the more brass hats there were about, until we got to a point where apparently full colonels pushed the tea trolley. We were getting so elevated. Got to the last office, and the brigadier swung smart right, got beyond the door, which was open this way, so I couldn't see what was behind it, uh, saluted very smartly and said, Miss Bowser. And I was so scared I missed my cue. My knees were knocking. It must have been a good five or six seconds before I could get underway. And I shut my eyes, marched straight forward to where I judged I was about right, and then turned left and opened my eyes. And there behind the desk, looking equally astounded as I was, was Bill Slim. And he leapt up, held out his hand, shook mine warmly, and said, Oh, thank God! I thought to be a lady missionary with creaking stays. <laughs> After which we got on like a house on fire. Was that um, the occasion, or was it uh, later, that he told you the story of how... On that occasion. That, that in... I mean, the Battle of Kohima was... and the holding of the Burmese was one of the turning points which saved India and possibly um, was a turning point in the Eastern War. And uh, he told you something about the Nagas' involvement in that. Yes. There was a very new unit called the Assam Regiment, which had never been in action before. And they had two posts, not very strong ones. Uh, one of my old friends, the Black Magic Village, Jessamy, the other one at Kalasong, which I also knew, I'd camped, uh, a few miles behind. And they were told to hold out as long as they could to try and delay the Japanese advance while defence proceedings were, uh, were going on in Kohima. Well, eventually there was no chance of their holding out. As a matter of fact, my husband walking out, passing to the north, heard the firing from the, that action. And they were told to get out and get back to the nearest British forces as best they could. They slipped out by night. Well, two of the NCOs were Nagas, and they must have been local men, I think. Uh, but instead of going back towards uh, the Manipur Plain, they nipped off to a local village, got into native dress, went back, found the Japanese HQ, 
went in with many flattering words about how pleased they were to see the Japanese to liberate them from the brutal British and all the rest of it, and could they please have a job. And they were taken on as water carriers and sweepers and so on at the Japanese HQ. And they stayed there about 10 days or so. Uh, the Japanese never suspected that these were tra uh, trained uh, sepoys, trained soldiers, until they knew the exact location and how to open the secret safe. They then carefully burgled it when nobody was looking one night, swept up all the papers in it, and made for um, uh, Imphal and the nearest of our troops that they could find, and handed over their hall. Well, when intelligence, having interpreted it, landed it on Slim's desk, he couldn't believe his eyes, because included in this was the Japanese battle plan for the advance on Kohima, Imphal and Imapur. And he thought, oh well, they'll realize that this is compromised and they will alter it. So he waited to see what did happen. And to his intense surprise and pleasure, the Japanese didn't realize that these two men were anything more than simple villagers who took the papers, probably thinking they were money. And they were sticking to their battle plan. And after that, he told me, he knew it beforehand, as soon as, almost as soon as the Japs did, what their battle plans were. And he was able to forestall it. He said that was what turned the tide. Amazing. Two Naga NCOs. Two Naga NCOs. So the fact that we're sitting here now in freedom may be partly attributed to those two Naga NCOs. Two Naga NCOs with an intelligence and acting ability. Because if India had fallen and China had fallen, well, the, the Chinese had, nationalist army had not been supplied over the hump from Assam, mm. the whole Eastern War would have been different. Oh, yes. And if the Eastern War had been lost, uh, the Western War would have been a, a good sight more difficult. Oh, yes. Um, anyway, that's... a. Uh, uh, an interesting, but perhaps we ought to come back to the social life of the Nagas mm -hmm. as well as their military prowess and loyalty. Um, Naga, Naga life was basically founded on agriculture, wasn't it? Yes, entirely. What kind of agriculture? It's what they call slash and burn. The jungle is felled. The first year, when it's burnt, the fallen jungle is burnt. That leaves a layer of ash to fertilize the soil. Then uh, the main crop, which is rice, is planted in that. Uh, the next year, a second sector of the uh, village land, close to it, adjoining it usually, is also cleared and burnt and planted with rice. Whereas the previous year's field is uh, put down to secondary crops, uh, millet, corn, vegetables, that kind of thing. And then the third year, the sequence is repeated, another new bit is taken in. And the first bit to be cut is allowed to lie fallow and go back under a secondary jungle. And the cycle should be no cutting except every 30 years. And there is very serious trouble if they cut sooner than that because the land does not regenerate. And all the fields for the whole village are usually, uh, the land permitting, all in one of these sectors, one of these strips, so that unlike isolated fields, they can be much more easily guarded with a crowd of people working in the fields against um, marauding animals and that kind of thing. Little isolated fields in the jungle wouldn't stand a chance. And so they go on these blocks round their um, arable land. But the Zemi among whom I were, uh, were having grave difficulty because it was very of a steep and mountainous country. 
and there was not enough land to run a proper uh, migration, at least cultivation cycle. The land was not regenerating and was getting worse and worse and worse. There was constant shortage. And that proved, in the end, to be at the root of the Gaidilu rising, the root cause. It was not consciously so, but things were getting very difficult for them. And so they were only too ready not to realize what was the matter, but to rationalize and put it down to the spirits and the hope that a promise of uh, plenty falling from heaven and a new religion would save the situation. Had they had any other solution to this problem of land scarcity? Could they not move? Yes, that really was the key to it. The, uh, the land was so rough, there was so little land that could be cultivated, uh, that land around a single village site was very quickly exhausted on the regular cycle which provided good crops. So the solution was when the land was getting poor to move the village to a new site where there was fresh arable land. And so in the course of time each village had a, a group of villages which were occupied in turn. There would be one and then when that was exhausted they move on to number two. Some had up to seven. And there was another one, and then there was another one, and then there was another one, then eventually they came back to number one, uh, which by this time had regenerated and would produce proper crops for some years. Sometimes the cycle lasted as long as a century till the ground was exhausted, if there was plenty of land. If there was very little, it might only it last a couple of generations. But when the area was taken over, a tribe from the south, the Cookies, who were akin to the Luchais or Mesos, were going in the usual direction of immigration into the area and moving into the south of North Kachoa, where the government had just arrived. It didn't know anything about this uh, system, didn't realize how short the land was, and allowed the Cookies to settle on what was really zemi fallow land, lying fallow waiting for recultivation. And so there were two tribes living on land which was only just sufficient for one. The result was constant scarcity and constant friction. And this was perceptible in, oh, as early as 1927, but it had been going on then quite a long time, ever since the cookies had arrived. And it was a bitter grievance with the Nagas that their ancestral sites were now in other hands. And they could not return on the only cycle by which they could live. There was constant scarcity and famine. Did they have um, any other means of getting food? For example, did they hunt and fish? Uh, well, meat was, had very little to do with their diet. Mm -hmm. Fishing was a little difficult. How did they fish? Well, uh, they used to use what is called fish poisoning. You get a certain creeper from the jungle, and it is beaten out. It comes out like soap suds. And either it stupefies the fish, and they float and can be caught by hand, or they bolt downstream away from the uh, creeper, and in too carefully set weirs and traps. But this is so destructive of fish in the not very large rivers that it's been forgiven by the go uh, forbidden by the government. I got permission to have one for recording purposes. I regret to say we caught very few fish, but a great time was had by all, and I got a very good film of it. Yes. The other method is trying to spear fish or catch them in weirs, but the rivers are not very full of fish. They're quite small rivers. It's the Barak, the big Barak that's got, uh, over in Manipur, that's got the fish in it. But uh, they also keep some animals, do they? Um, they keep a kind of um, uh, semi-feral uh, bison, domesticated version of the wild bison, 
they are largely sacrificial animals, and almost the only time they get meat. These are the meat time. Is when there is, it's the mitten, yes. Mm. Uh, Bos frontalis is the uh, proper name for it, the Latin name. But they only get meat from it when there's a big sacrifice and they can afford to um, kill one or more. They keep pigs, but then again, meat is a treat and a rarity. Mm. They eat rice very largely, make rice beer out of it. The staple is rice and it's eaten with a vegetable relish. And it's the rice that's the dart and the, um, the staple, and just the vegetables with large quantities of chilies in, uh, which is the relish. Did you eat naga food or? As a matter of politeness, a little bite or two when it was offered to me. But it was too hot on the whole to, to eat, was it? Oh, usually. <laughs> Lots of salt and, and Lots peppers. of salt and chilies. Well, they can eat chilies as though they're chocolates. And they, what sort of meats do they eat? I mean, do, will they, do they ref confine themselves to meatan and so on, or will they eat other kinds of meat? Uh, they'll eat uh, pork. They're very fond of pork. Uh, beef from the mitten when they can get it, which isn't often. Mm. Um, they don't get very much game. The forests have been largely hunted out. Uh, chickens, very rarely, they keep those for the eggs. But meat plays a very small part in their diet. What about dogs? It was alleged that. Uh, well, the they do eat them. It's supposed to be medicinal, but um, I think it's very rare. Mm. There are uh, plenty of dogs in the village, but uh, I've very rarely actually known them eaten. Mm. So you would eat. European-style food on the whole? Well, I had to live very largely on curry because there was nothing to make European mm. food with. Mm. Who, Rice and curry. Who, what was your entourage, so to speak, in the village? You, you had this, your, the key person was Namkya. Yes, Namkya was my head interpreter mm. and head servant. Uh, then came, well, there was a cook, he was a Gokali cook. Then uh, there was a dog boy. Um, a man who took the mail to Half Long Bazaar once a week. Uh, it was uh, a three day run there and back. Did shopping in the bazaar and came back with the letters. And a gardener. And a scullion who helped the cook. And there were seven of them. Well, none of the Nog of the Zemi are very tall. Some of the Angami is a five foot ten and six foot. I've never seen a Zemi much more than five foot seven, and tall, he was tall at that. And I t was considerably taller even than Namkir, he was tall. I felt rather like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. How did you maintain the Seven Dwarfs? Because you were, you'd left home as a, at 23, 24, um, and you were living in the, the Naga Hills. How did you survive? I mean, you hadn't got a, a paid job to do this, presumably. I had um, a small income of my own. Uh, as time went well, by the time I'd put aside, I had um, 450 rupees a month, which was not a great deal, 450 a year, roughly, for mm. everything. Uh, 50 rupees a month went aside for medicines because it was absolutely imperative to keep an emergency medicine chest. There was no meds medical help to be had at all. Mm. There was a, only a small dispensary way down the line with no nursing facilities. There was a hospital in Half Long, but no nursing. The family had to go in with the patient, and they were very reluctant to go because of that. Uh, it meant taking your family in to cook your food and nurse you, which they didn't like. Once or twice we had to get people into hospital in emergency and uh, it took the most fearful threats of bullying to get them moving and usually I had to pay their keep. But we did save some people that way, two anyway, three, four we got in. In both cases they all survived. One was bare claw, the other one was a, a woman with the most ghastly abscess. She would have died otherwise. And then um, uh, I put aside 50 pounds a year for my annual holiday in Kolkata to get the jungle leaves out of my hair. That was all that you had out of the 
away from? I, yes. I had, um, um, well, 50 pounds a year for medicines, 50 pounds a year for my holiday, and uh, 300 a year for myself, one large dog and seven men. Mm. It wasn't what you might call a very luxurious existence, but it worked. Mm. We got on. Yes, and you had a typewriter as well. Which you? was always breaking down. Yes. And I had my camera. What kind of camera did you have? I had a Leica 3, mm. which I've still got, and it's still going. It was a good camera. A very good camera. And you took a lot of photographs. Uh, I think it came out at about 4,000 altogether. Mm. Did you find it difficult to get film? And uh, After about 1941-42, it was practically impossible to get film at all. And once we were three, four, through 42, into 42, there was just none. And until uh, well on in 44, where things were getting a little easier, um, I was dependent for film on any kindly war correspondent who'd spare me a, a cassette. And very often those were stale stock and failed to survive the conditions of the monsoon. Hmm. So I've got very, very little from those wartime years. Hmm. Nearly everything was taken in Manipur before I came to North Kachar, or in the first two years in North Kachar. And you also took some movie film? Yes. I got about, um, uh, let me see, about 2,000 odd on the Zeminagas. Hmm. Something like that. Hmm. 2,000 feet? 2,000 feet, yes. Hmm. And there again, it was terribly difficult to get uh, 16 millimeter color film once the war had started. Mm. and absolutely every frame had to be husbanded. And you, d you didn't even have a zoom lens or anything? You had to take it all with one single lens? All with one single lens. Mm. I, a zoom was well, well, it was practically unheard of. Mm. I wanted, I had a Bell and Howell, which did me famously, never mm. went wrong. Uh, but I very badly wanted, they had a Bell and Howell with a turret head with three lenses on it. I, wish I had had that. But uh, I just hadn't got the money to buy it at that time. Did you, did you find that, um, that the Nagas, in some areas, they were very camera shy and they, they didn't want to be photographed? Did you find that with...? Uh, not really. Uh, so quite often the women were a little bit reluctant and used to squeak and run. Mm. The men were not, not in the least bothered. Mm. Uh, uh, when I was up in the Tonkal country in my earlier days in Manipur, I saw a girl who had obviously come across from the un unadministered territory around Somra. And um, I was longing to get a picture of her. She was something very different. She had huge discs of crystal uh, hanging from her ears. They had a slit in them. And this was slipped through the earlobe and turned so that the slit was underneath. And these great crystal discs that size were hanging from the earlobe. And she had uh, bits of cotton, across, cotton thread across her head to help take the weight. And uh, I was trying to stalk her. She was talking to some of the villagers. And I was and sort of gazing at the distant view and pointing the camera and pretending I was looking at that and hoping to swing around and get her. And unfortunately, she turned and saw me and ran. So I missed her. Mm. And um, towards the end of this time, or s sometime when you were actually filming with your movie camera, you came across a, um, the sort of conflict that anthropologists often have between being participants and being observers. You were observing with your camera, but you were also watching a huge um, rock oh, yes. being pulled in. What happened uh, when you... <laughs> Well, of course, it was part of the stone dragging ceremony. They've got a sort of, well, no, don't put up, there is a very near Stonehenge in one part up at, um, up near, near Kohima in Nagaland. I never got to see that. It's a remarkable mm. sight. Uh, but they bring in these huge gravestones. They still do this stone dragging. And once you've seen it happen, you realize that Stonehenge is not as impossible as you think it is. Though they're nothing like as big as Stonehenge, 
there's nothing like the stones there. Uh, but this particular one was up on a very difficult hillside, very steep, 45 degrees, in jungle, and had to be brought down a little way and then over this folded hillside across a 45 degree slope in a path which had been cut through the jungle. And the rule is to drag a stone downhill or along the level. They put it on a kind of sledge and they get a great team on. They can get 300 men on if the country's right. There's enough room pulling on cane ropes. And it's done by everybody going pulling together. There's a cheerleader who sort of says one, two, three, and on the last three they all heave till they get it moving, and then they just walk away with it, more or less. Well, this one was built into a kind of scaffolding, flat scaffolding. It's a big stone, seven foot by five, and about that thick. I don't know what it weighed. And they had this scaffolding built around it, a flat scaffolding, with poles this way. And the men get round it on a solid block, there were 80 on this one, and carry it on their shoulders. And they've got two cane ropes out behind with a team on them, and two cane ropes in front again with a team on, which are used for braking and steering. And how they got it across that country, I don't know. But I was filming it. I was going ahead, walking ahead of it, and then watching this crowd coming along, and the ground was so rough that not more than a quarter of them could have been taking the weight at the same time. The others were all just hanging on, trying to keep their feet. The thing was tilting this way and that, this way and that, everybody chanting and yelling. And, um, it was a, a stupendous scene. They looked just like a, a solid mass of ants carrying an enormous grasshopper, a very large grey grasshopper. And then the going got worse and worse. And suddenly the stone, they lost control, and the whole lot went careering down the steepening hillside into the jungle, people being knocked off their feet. There was obviously a thing was coming over into the middle of the crowd, and there was going to be a most ghastly accident. But at that moment I dropped everything. I may say I was carrying everybody's necklaces, people who didn't want their necklaces broken with the poles on their shoulders. I was wearing about three people's necklaces and carrying cloths and using a movie camera and my Leica slung around me. I hurled all these down underneath the tree and I and three or four small boys, the old head man who was a spectator, grabbed uh, one of the rear anchor ropes and we were dragged down the slope very nearly sitting down behind this stone, and then the old head man and I managed to get the rope round a tree and hang on like grim death, and we anchored it a bit, we belayed it. Somebody managed to get the other anchor rope round another tree once the thing was checked, and everybody regained their feet and managed, after a most fearful struggle, to get it back onto the path. Well, by that time, and by the time I'd picked up the camera and picked up everything else, got my breath and gone on ahead and dusted most of the mud off the seat of my shorts, because I had been definitely towed down the slope along with the headband. Um, we were in the village, but I was just there in time to, find, to film the final stage of it being carried in. So you're both a participant and an observer. What I must be, I think, the only lady anthropologist who has ever actually dragged a monolith. <laughs> what was the significance of the monolith? It was a gravestone. Mm. So it's celebrating the, the deeds of the, the dead? Uh, no, they put them up over the graves. Mm. Uh, they have a look over the grave shaft. They make a little square box of flat slabs. Mm. What looked like uh, the monuments known as dolmens, chambered, mm. prehistoric chambered tombs in this country. Then they carry in these vast capstones, and in the very last ceremony of the year, before the ceremony of dismissing the dead, who were supposed to stay in the village for a year after the death, until the next winter solstice festival when they, all the ghosts are dismissed. Uh, just before that happens, they put the gravestone up and with the side slabs, they put this great big flat slab over the top, mm. and that's the finish. So 
So this is different from the Feasts of Merit, where they have a, con a huge display and feasting. Oh yes, that's a different series altogether. Mm. The um, graves, you see them all down the village street, these mm. flat slabs that are, they're covered with earth initially, and then as the monsoon erodes the soil of the street, they come out in these flat, step-like platforms in the street. But the Feasts of Merit are a way of acquiring status and it's also economically a very useful way of redistributing wealth. Villages which don't have them, and I think the Aus don't have them, I think I've been told that already, and a rich man can accumulate so much rice which he, that he can't use it, and it just rots in the granary. But those with feasts of merit you start very humbly down the bottom by sacrificing a pig and having a, a religious, a small religious ceremony, a small feast. That starts the series. Then you go on to another and bigger one, and so up the scale, so to speak, um, um, CBE knighthood, mm. uh, baronet, mm. uh, Lord Smith. And so right up to get to the top, when they build uh, a very special house, the cowboy have the same sort of thing, a very special house, which is restricted to those who have performed this Feast of Merit. And usually the house uh, is used as a young man's house. But you can't build one or do these very expensive ceremonies uh, until you've been through the whole chain. And there's one even greater one, but it costs so much money that it had never been done within living memory. And though we had a very good search, we couldn't find any old gentleman who could remember the proper ritual. Do they, they obviously display their prowess and their wealth through fe feasts of merit. Do they have the custom of displaying their sexual prowess uh, in, in some of their costume, as do some of the Naga groups? Well, uh, a young man must not uh, put up a hornbill feather in his hair if he is a virgin, otherwise his hair falls out. They also put up rows of small stones, little stone rows, outside the villages. Uh, celebrating the gentleman's love affairs, but in honour of a dead man, that is, just to show what a fine man he was, each one representing a lady who succumbed to his charms. But there they needn't be absolutely accurate. They can add on a few just to make it look a bit better. But there is another ceremony in which he has to don a headdress uh, I forget exactly how the tally is uh, shown, whether it's hornbills, feathers, or what. But there, he has to go out into the open and between heaven and earth, swear solemnly that his tally is absolutely correct. And um, they dare not violate that. It's got to be correct. They don't have this fourth layer of cowrie shells. No, that's the young armies. Yeah. Well, they don't run to that. Mm. They, but they have the headdress. Mm. And they have the stone rows. Yes. They also decorate, um, they don't decorate their uh, skirts with the human hair and other hair, but um, do they do that with some of their weapons, with their shields, for example? Oh, the headhunter's shield has got human hair on it. Mm. There was only one village that I came across, though well, there may have been others further on into Manipur. And that was Magulong, which was one of my favorite villages, very great mm. friends of ours. We had a, a, a watch post there during the war, very fine village. And they had fought on the British side against the Cookie Rebellion in 1917, on which occasion the, the young men took the opportunity to get heads. I forget how many there were, I think six or eight of them got heads. One of them was the headman, Kutuing, and there were several others. And um, they had these headhunter shields. They were great big bamboo shields, 
was almost as tall as a man. And they were tufted all down the front with human hair. The top layer was the hair off the head. And the headhunter also kept two good tufts of hair, which he wore as ear ornaments on ceremonial occasions. And after they'd got the hair off the head along the top row, every time his friends and relations had a haircut, and there he was to have a tail of hair hanging down the back from this... Sh in that group they had a short mm. haircut, and then this tail of hair down the back. Every time they cut the tail of hair, another tuft was kindly contributed to the, uh, the headhunter's shield. And there was a taboo on, except when it was used uh, for fun, for dancing, where they were doing a mock fight at some entertainment when anybody could use it, taking part. It was taboo for a man who had not taken a head to carry the thing. And, uh, well, when my husband and I went to Margalong on a certain somewhat lively occasion, we collected a headhunter's shield. And when we eventually left the area, um, they couldn't let just anybody carry it. They got one of the headhunters to come down. They rated my husband a headhunter on his military record, but they couldn't see a senior officer walking 60 miles across the mountains carrying a hairy shield. It wasn't right. So they sent a man all the way 60 miles to the railroad to carry the thing down for us. And that's the one that's in the Pit Rivers? That is the one we took to the Pit Rivers Museum, yes. Hmm. There was some slight argument as to whether they had anybody who could carry it in. <laughs> I think eventually they got hold of one of the porters who had war service and it went in under the proper auspices. You, you mentioned um, your husband. Um, most of the time when you were there, when you were fighting, you were unmarried. Yes. How was it that suddenly in this remote area you got married? Well, it's a very odd story. Um, of course, I was rather an oddity, and V-Force all knew of me, and uh, my brother officers uh, spilt the most awful yarns quite untrue about me and my Naga bodyguard who took the head off anybody who looked at me. And uh, anyhow, my husband, after his walkout, was uh, back in V-Force, and he heard these tales about the uh, lady in the jungle, and he began to take a considerable interest. And no opportunity of coming and having a look at me arose until uh, June, I think it was, uh, 1945, when uh, he was in Shillong, where V-Force was reforming with the idea of being sent into Malaya. And he decided he'd take leave and go and have a look at me, which he'd been meaning to do for a long time. I discovered this in his diary when I was looking at it the other day. And uh, he asked for ten days' leave on urgent private affairs. The CEO said, well, look here, we're being posted. You can't do that. What's it all about? To which my future husband responded, well, as a matter of fact, I was going to have a look at the Naga Queen to see if I'd like to marry her. It was the first time in history that anybody had ever seen his officer flabbergasted, his senior officer. He got his leave. And it was the monsoon, it was pouring with rain. Well, I got a letter from him first to say that he was very keen on butterfly hunting and could he come up for a few days and have a look for butterflies. Well, we were a magnificent area for butterflies. So I thought, oh, Lord, what a bother. I'll have to find more porters because they're very hard to get. Over, I said, OK. And I heard no more. And... Um, I'd forgotten all about it, and there was a drenching wet day, we couldn't open the front door, and Namkia arrived with an air of extreme disapproval and said, there is a sob outside, so he was announcing the Loch Ness Monster, <laughs> and I went very cautiously out of the back door, because it was pouring, and looked along there at the edge of the camp, there was a very long, thin, and extremely wet colonel, and one small, and even wetter, Gurkha orderly. 
Because I was in heaven, it's this colonel. How on earth am I going to do? What a nuisance. <laughs> so anyhow, we got him in. We turned the orderly into the cookhouse and the Gurkhali cook. And I got him in, got uh, Tim in, filled him up with tea. And uh, the next day, uh, it was fairly fine. And I directed him to the valley where I knew the burst butterflies were. He seemed remarkably reluctant to go butterfly hunting. I got really annoyed that he would not get off the premises. He would keep sitting about in the veranda and asking me to point out places on the map. And I was really getting quite cross about this. And finally I managed to chase him off the premises on the fourth day. He went down into the valley with his butterfly net and returned unexpectedly earlier. And I was in the um, kitchen with the cook. Uh, busily engaged in directing the making of a cake for my guest's tea. And uh, again, Namke arrived with a most disapproving expression and said, the Saab wants to see you. And um, I went out, and there he was, in a brand new clean uniform, not the one he'd arrived in, pacing up and down, pacing up and down, between the bungalow and the vegetable garden, I thought, oh heavens, I suppose he wants to go and there are no porters, everybody's in the fields. Oh, what a nuisance. There was I, flower, flower all down my jungle green trousers and went out to him and we were sort of pacing up and down. My mind was on the cake. And all of a sudden, just as we were opposite one of the flower beds, I realised to my amazement I was on the business end of a proposal of marriage. And I was so startled, I didn't know what I said. I think I just said, oh, uh, um, or something to that effect, uh, which was taken as acceptance. So you duly got married and then... We, we duly got married. Well, we were engaged in four days. Mm. Then he was posted. I went up to Shillong. Well, this time I'd got cold feet and was trying to get out of it. Met the Mills family. Asked Mrs Mills in agony how I was going to get out of it. So said, oh, but my dear, you must marry him. He's an absolute darling. He's been to call him. He's an absolute darling. You must marry him. Marry him. Which flattened me. And um, that was the Sunday. On Thursday afternoon, I was Mrs. Betts. Ursula, I think we're running out of time. Oh, yeah. um, very sadly. Mm -hmm. But um, I wanted to thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope that some of this will be shown one day to the Zemi Nagas. Um, I hope so. So perhaps you can just say hello to the Zemi Nagas or mm -hmm. wish them well, as I'm sure you will have done. And there we perhaps ought mm -hmm. to end. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, is our Malou. E is a Bamloi. E is a Taranoi. Oh, is our Malou. Oh, an Argao.